Okay, welcome back, family Bible time. We are in Galatians, Galatians. It comes after Corinthians and before Ephesians. So Acts, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. Galatians chapter 4, we're doing 4, 5 and 6 today. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, there are more juicy, difficult verses to interpret in these three chapters um, than I can possibly cope with. And it's Sunday evening, I think I was up at three this morning, and uh, the little girl here, we're, it's now quarter to ten in the evening, this is how the Sunday goes sometimes for us. So chances of me doing a, a detailed study are small, but we'll do what we can, and we'll pray, pray for the Lord's help. And this little girl has had a long day and you're tired, so we'll pray. We'll ask the Lord to quieten the puppies who have been running riot. Are we ready? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise you that you would uh, please help us as we read your word. Thank you for your blessing day by day. The, just the huge privilege, the huge privilege that it is to read and to learn from you. Um, please teach us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Galatians chapter 4. I mean that the heir, the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. There we are. If you feel like a slave, that's biblical. Just kidding. But it's kind of how it feels sometimes when you are... You're not free to just do anything you want to do. Um, you're under guardians and managers until the date set by your father. In the, same way also, in the same way we also, when we were children, enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. So we were, in, when we were children, and let me rephrase that, in the same way we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son, into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Isn't that amazing? I mean, it's, there's so much dense theology there that I can't explain it in a few words. Um, but in essence, it's a picture of... Um, the, the picture of a child growing up and going from immaturity to maturity and freedom and it's compared to the Christian life and, and it's compared to becoming a Christian going from um, going from a situation where you needed to be um, guarded by guardians and under rules and regulations and then being set free when you got uh, old enough. Uh, and so the, the picture here is that becoming a Christian, you, beforehand you needed the law. Remember that phrase in the last section, the law was our guardian to lead us to Christ. Um, so the, the picture is becoming a believer and you don't need the law in the same way. Instead, you you have the, God has put the spirit of his son in our hearts so that we cry, Abba, Father. We, we, we've got this relationship with him. It's amazing. 
Formerly, when you did not know God, verse 8, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be, be once more? Now, um, what, what was the problem in the Galatian churches? Remember there were people telling them that unless you are something, you cannot be saved. Unless you're circumcised, you cannot be saved, right? So they're wanting to add back, having been freed and having, you could say, grown up, been freed from the constraints of the, the law, now they're wanting to add back um, laws and regulations. And, and Paul is saying to them, how can you, how can you want to be slaves again? You've been made free. How can you want to go back to that? And then verse 10, he says, you observe days and months and seasons and years. And you can hear him kind of going, what? What are you doing, you idiots? You're, you're getting back into observing all the Jewish holidays and days and months and seasons and years. Um, I'm afraid I may have labored over you in vain. Brothers, I entreat you, Become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You did me no wrong. You, you know that it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you. Some people think that it was Paul had a problem with his eyes and he ended up having to stay there and preach. But anyway. Um, uh, 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 yeah, so his eyesight... Uh, apparently, um, but that's some pe just, just some people think that. Anyway, you know that it was because of bodily, bodily aim that I preached the gospel to you at first, and though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. What then has become of the blessing you felt? For I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. See, hence you thinking, people thinking perhaps it was Paul's eyes that were troubling him. So if you could see this, you would see the puppies running round and round in circles chasing each other. Okay, they've stopped. Have I become your enemy? By telling you the truth, they make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out, that you may make much of them. It's always good to be made much of for a good purpose. And not only when I am present with you, my little children, for whom I am in, again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I'm perplexed about you. You know the way parents sometimes change their tone when they're speaking to you. Let's say they say something like, "Ailey, what Ailey? What's what are you doing?" Like that, instead of "Ailey, good girl," and then "Ailey." So Paul's saying, "I wish I could be with you and change my tone because I just don't understand what you're doing." Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? It is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. And this is where it's going to get really deep. Okay, this is kind of a depth warning. We're going, we're going into deep water here. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now, this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. 
But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother, for it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as, that, just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. Chapter 5. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Now, what, what kind of freedom and slavery is he talking about here? He's talking about that, yes, go on. Actually, no. Here, the slavery he's talking about is not slavery. It's not slavery to sin. <laughs> it's those pesky dog, pesky pups are going crazy. Um, it's not slavery to sin. It's slavery by, by becoming slaves to having to obey the law again. So they're, they're saying... There are people saying you've got to be circumcised in order to be saved. And the Galatian, pe Galatian church was starting to go along with it. But that's like a form of slavery, isn't it? Because remember, if you don't obey the whole law, you're under a curse. So they're, they're putting themselves back under the law. They've escaped from it. They've become free. But now they're starting to put themselves back into slavery to having to obey the whole law. And, and he says, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you, verse 2, that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. Now, hold on a minute. This is the same Paul that took Titus and, test and circumcised him, didn't he? Timothy. Titus was not compelled to be circumcised, but he took Timothy and he circumcised Timothy so because everyone knew his father was a Greek. So he did circumcision for the sake of the gospel to not put a stumbling block in the way of Jews who needed to hear the gospel, but he's telling the Galatians, if you accept circumcision in these terms, Ailey, come here, come back, lie down, say again, do you think you can calm them down? There's some, so they are completely bonkers at the minute, aren't they? Um, Take okay. <laughs> Ailey, lie down in your bed. In your bed. All right, we're going to see if we can get these pups calmed down. Thank you, Donna. Can you hear me? All right. You did it. You managed it the other day, didn't you? Yeah. Okay. So back to reality. He says to the he says to Titus, "Hey, we're going to circumcise you for the sake of the Jews." But then he he says to the Galatians, he says, "Look, if you accept circumcision under these terms, if you accept circumcision in order to as as like a requirement for to be saved, Christ is not going to be any good to you. Why not?" Well, you, you remember what he said earlier. He said, "If you." The, the law, with the law, there's a curse. Cursed is anyone who does not continue to do all that is required in the law. So if you say, I'm going to, everyone must be circumcised in order to be saved, well, you've got to add all the other laws as well, haven't you? You can't just pick circumcision. 
So you've got to keep the whole law or you're cursed. Well, that's how the law was a schoolmaster to lead them to Christ. The law was a guardian to kind of take them by the hand and say, look, you need Christ because the law said to them, you don't meet God's standard. Look, you fail, you sin everywhere. You need a Messiah, you need a savior. Now, he's saying to them, if you accept circumcision, you're obligated. Verse th Christ will be no advantage to you. Verse three, I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. Obligated, you know what that means? It means you're, you have to. It, if you're, you're obliged to, you, you have no choice. If you accept circumcision as a prerequisite for salvation, you've got to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. Which, by the way, you know, some people would take that verse and say, look, there's proof you can fall away from being saved. No, he's saying, look, if you fall, if you, if you, say that you're justified by the law, you've fallen away from understanding that salvation is by grace. Uh, for, by, for through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith, working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view than mine, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. And that's interesting in the light of today's sermon. Um, I know you weren't in the big church, were you? But we, um, the sermon today was all about how the the... Uh, there, the difference between holy angels and evil angels and the fact that Satan is at work in the world. And one of the things Satan loves to do is just to deceive Christians. We're going to deal with this next week uh, in the follow-up sermon. I'm going to be looking at just how demons deceive people. And Paul is saying, look, there's this person who's troubling you, and it would be a false teacher who was preaching a message where, where they, he would say, you've got to be circumcised and, and keep the law of Moses to be saved. Well, who's inspiring a teacher like that? It's not God, is it? That's one of the things that demons do, is inspire false prophets and false teachers in churches. And and so um, Paul's pretty strong with this issue. Uh, he says, the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Whoops, now there's a, there's a strong term. Um, you know, circumcision is cutting off a little bit of flesh, isn't it? It's just a, a little small piece of skin. Well, emasculating yourself is cutting off the whole thing. Let's put it like that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's, Paul says, I wish that those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. He's saying, I wish they'd go the whole way and instead of just circumcising themselves, um, cut the whole thing off. And his point is, is just these people are so, are, so, are so hypocritical. He wishes that they, were, they would take drastic action and, and be exposed for the, for the fools that they were. Verse 13, you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law in one, 
is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say walk in the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. Now, um, listen up, if you've been struggling with some of it so far, this is really, really, really practical. We're now going to read about the difference between the desires of your flesh, your sinful flesh, and the desires of the spirit. And in verse 17 he says, the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. And the desires of the spirit against the flesh. For these are opposed to one another to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Mm. You say, well, that would be bad, wouldn't it, if something kept me from doing the things I wanted to do. No, not if you've got sinful flesh in you which wants to do sinful things. So that's the reality for every Christian, by the way. You see, so this helps you to understand yourself. As if you're truly Christian, you've got true desires to love God. You do love God, and, and you've got true desires to serve Him and to do good things. But you've also still got your sinful flesh. It'll be with you till the day you die. But your sinful flesh has desires. It has things that it wants. Maybe your sinful flesh loves just like comfort. And you're just like, I just want comfort. I just want comfort. And, and, and your, your sinful flesh will be saying, give me comfort or I'll, I'll die. <laughs> or give me comfort. Give me food to make me feel happy. And... and and when it's sinful, it's like, no, that's covetousness or that's greed or whatever it is. And you know it's sinful. Your sinful flesh says, I don't care, I want it. And, and so, but the desires of the spirit are opposed to this to keep you from doing just what you want, the things you want to do. Verse, six, verse 18 now, but if you are led by the spirit... You're not under the law. So if the Spirit is controlling you, that you, you're not, you don't need to be told, don't be greedy. If the Spirit's controlling you, you'll, you'll not want to be greedy. <laughs> you'll be saying, oh no, I'm, I'm not going to be greedy because I'm walking in step with the Spirit. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Now he's going to give some examples. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now he's going to contrast it with the Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. You know this, come on, say it with me. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It must be in a different order in the Bible I learned it from. <laughs> he says, excusing himself. And against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. You've said, I'm dead, I'm dead to this flesh. And this flesh is dead to me. Verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. Brothers, if anyone is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore such a one, should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. 
Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. One who is taught the word must share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will, from the flesh, reap corruption. The one who sows to the Spirit will, from the Spirit, reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Isn't that wonderful, wonderful passage which just teaches us to, to be mutually concerned for one another, bear one another's burdens. If someone's caught in sin, restore them in a spirit of gentleness. If you think you're something, when you're nothing, you deceive yourself. Um, it's, it's, it, this is a beautiful picture of the Christian life. And Paul is saying, look, as Christians, we can't say, that's not my problem. That person has trouble, not, not, not my problem. No, that, that person has trouble, that person has burdens. I'm supposed to be burdened. I'm supposed to be concerned for them. Paul, Paul was like this, wasn't he? he? He said, besides everything else, the daily pressure, of my, the burden of concern for all the churches, he felt it. And I know you see it, don't you, when mummy and I feel, we feel the, the pain or, the, pressure or the, the burdens that other people in the church are going through, and you hear us sighing a lot, don't you? <laughs> You're like, yeah, big sighs. And that's part of being in a church, is you don't, you don't just ignore the other people who are suffering, you feel for them, and as you feel for them, you, you, you have to bear their burdens somewhat. You, if they're hurting, you hurt. If they're happy, you're happy. But that's part of being in a body. A wonderful part of being, in a, uh, being a pastor in the body is verse 6 one who's taught in the word, sharing all good things with the one who teaches. What a blessed life we lead, um, having people gratefully, um, gratefully give back to us as we give the word to them. That is uh, one of the greatest joys, isn't it? Verse 11, see with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they might not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised, that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. As for those who, as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them. And that would be the people in the church. And then he says, and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. <coughs> Pardon me, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen.
What a letter from Paul to the Galatians. Now, we can't just let this go without recapturing the central theme. What is the central theme? The central theme is the issue of justification by faith alone. Justification by faith alone. Not justification by faith in what Jesus did and being circumcised and keeping the law of Moses. Not not justification by faith in what Jesus did and anything else. You have to say, this doctrine of justification by faith alone, which is central to the letter to the Galatians, it's central to the book of Romans, it is the core issue that Satan loves to attack. He'll always be trying to take you back like the Galatians, to legalism, back to adding something. You can be right with God if you keep these rules, if you observe these dietary rules, if you keep observe these special days, if you don't do this, if you do do that, then you can be right with God. No, it is just justification by faith. Let's say it all together. Alone. alone. Father, we pray, thanking you that true faith is never alone, but uh, is always accompanied by good works. But it is only it, it is only faith alone in Christ that you choose as the the uh, the, the root for our justification, that we're justified when we trust in him and, when, and we're not justified by our good works in any way, shape or form. Lord, we pray that you would help us to trust in you completely and bless your word to us now, Lord, and deliver us from the tendency that we have to return to legalism. In Jesus' name, thank you that you've set us free and you've set us free for freedom. Amen. Amen. Well, um, they always seem to calm down at the end, don't they? Do they do they know <laughs> that it's all over and they can be quiet now? I'm going to say goodbye. Uh, camera queen, can you do your stuff? Are your eyes sufficiently open? I'll say we'll see you tomorrow. God bless you. Until then, adios amigos. Afui de Seine, bonne nuit, au revoir. <laughs>